This episode of Felon is brought to you by Marley Spoon. Marley Spoon is changing the way you cook. And over the past week, they've changed the way I cook. If you're unfamiliar with Marley Spoon, put simply, they're a meal kit delivery service. They create simple recipes and source local ingredients, conveniently delivering it straight to your door so you can avoid the supermarket. The best thing about Marley Spoon is the amount of choice you have. You get to choose all the recipes that you want to cook, so it's suited to your exact taste. There are 16 recipes that change every week, so there's plenty for everyone, including vegetarians and the health conscious. As a special offer to Fallon listeners in Australia, you can head to marleyspoon.com.au and use code FELLON for $35 off your first delivery. Last week, I received my very own Marley Spoon box. The recipes I was able to sample included Caribbean beef, caramel chicken, and chipotle salmon. The ingredients were fresh, the meals were quick and simple to create, and most importantly, they were all delicious. When ordering your Marley Spoon meals, you can choose your own weekly menu from 16 recipes. It's not just meat or veggie boxes with the same recipes every week. At Marley Spoon, they source the ingredients from local farmers, so the produce is incredibly fresh, top quality, and sustainably sourced. Most of all, you save time. You won't need to figure out what to cook. You won't need to go shopping. You won't need to buy things you don't need. Marley Spoon takes that all away. All your meals will arrive pre-portioned and in separate bags. So you can just pop it in the fridge and grab it when you're ready to cook. Every recipe takes six steps. Can be cooked in 30 minutes. In my case, I shaved it down to 25 and they all taste amazing. You can cook for two or for a family of four. And because of the pre-portioned ingredients, there's zero food waste. You have the option to plan your menu and deliveries up to eight weeks in advance. And the flexible subscription means you can skip a week or pause your subscription when you need to. You can organize to take it away with you on long weekends or cook up a feast for your guests on Christmas or a special occasion by simply adding extra portions. Marley Spoon also have an app so you can choose meals on the go and there's an archive of over a thousand recipes you can browse and cook up. Some upcoming recipes include Grilled chicken salad with broccoli, grains, mango and almonds. Turkish chickpea patties in pita pockets. And chipotle salmon with kidney bean and rocket salad. And so to get $35 off your first delivery, head to marleyspoon.com.au. That's M-A-R-L-E-Y-S-P-O-O-N.com.au. And use the code FELON. With Marley Spoon, you can cook better and live smarter. I got a lot of regrets, but the victims, I don't think, suffered. It was quick. That's no consolation. It doesn't make it right. But I've never felt sorry. And, and I don't think that I need to apologize for anything that I've done, because I think that I've been punished severely for it. I screwed up. I've hurt a lot of people. I admit that. But I won't apologize for it. No one will ever get it, because I can't do that. I'm not sorry. I can't dwell on it. If I dwell on it, do I go back there? Welcome to Felon, True Crime Podcast. Season 2, Episode 2, The Kill 7 Murders. In 1973, a tragic event in the life of a troubled individual led to a violent killing spree in Sydney. Seven were marked for death when a voice from beyond the grave spoke to him. A warning to listeners that this episode contains coarse language and descriptions of violence, so discretion is advised. His mind has balanced precariously close to the chasm of insanity. He can't remember a moment in time he has felt normal, or what normal is supposed to feel like, but recently he has sensed a fleeting glimpse. Their life together has been volatile and irrational, sometimes violent. But now they both have something more to live for. A new life has brought meaning to theirs, and he is a shining beam of light in what has been a dark existence until now. In one so small lies their hope of a normal life that dreams of a brighter future. But, just as his arrival brought light, his sudden departure would leave them in darkness once again. Born in 1948, Archie McCafferty spent his formative years in Glasgow, Scotland. From an early age, 
Archie exhibited disturbing behaviours for one so young. At nine years old, he would roam the streets with a dog and would allow it to jump on young girls. He would then cut off their ponytails and run home to put them in a case. McCafferty would also find amusement in hunting down local pet cats. He would take them to the top of high-rise buildings and throw them off. He would then hurry down with excitement to see the mangled remains. What I did the cats back then, I used to go to the top tenant, throw them out the window and run down the stairs as fast as I could to see what they looked like at the bottom. This cruelty may have been a response to his poor treatment at home. His father, Archie Senior, was a harsh disciplinarian who would lock young McCafferty in a coal bin for extended periods of time. He would also beat him with the buckle of a large fireman's belt. But despite his father's violent efforts to set him on the straight and narrow, McCafferty's antisocial behaviour continued and he soon found himself in trouble with the law on a regular basis. This behaviour escalated to the point that his parents felt their delinquent son needed a change of scenery. So in 1958, when young Archie was 10 years old, they packed their bags and migrated to Australia. They hoped that this would be a fresh start for the three of them. They first lived in Melbourne, but eventually settled in Bass Hill, a blue-collar suburb of Western Sydney. But this relocation merely provided a different backdrop to the same behaviour, and young Archie soon found himself in trouble with Australian authorities. I was always in trouble, you know, just, just general trouble, stealing. If it wasn't nailed down, I'd take it. It was just my way of life. I was a thief. When I was 10 or 11, I remember saying I wanted to be a criminal. At the age of 12, he was placed into an institution for stealing. This would be a repeated pattern of behaviour for the next 12 years. By the time McCafferty had turned 18, he had been in and out of boys' homes five times. At the age of 24, he had spent a substantial amount of his adult life in jail for a range of crimes, chalking up 35 convictions, including vagrancy, break and enter, stealing cars, larceny and assault, just to name a few. McCafferty's crimes rarely involved violence towards anyone but in discussions with his psychiatrist, he revealed that he would find enjoyment in torturing and killing small animals, including cats, dogs, and chickens. In 1972, McCafferty met a woman named Janice Reddington, who was working at a hotel he attended. The two hit it off, and after a brief courtship, they were married in that same year. McCafferty saw Janice as a beacon of hope and a reason to go straight. His worried family also hoped Janice would be the stable influence that McCafferty seemed to need. I think when I look at Janice, I think she was probably my first love. When I didn't have it from my family, I found it with her. I, I decided to give up crime and try to make a normal life. McCafferty swore that he would stay out of trouble and found employment working as a garbage collector. It seemed that his life was finally on track. Until one day, only six weeks into the marriage, Janice arrived home to find Archie in bed with another woman. His response was not one of remorse. He became violent towards Janice, and so severe was his hostility towards her that he was required to attend a psychiatric hospital. After a short period of time in the hospital, McCafferty discharged himself and returned home. He threw away the sedatives that he was prescribed and started to drink heavily. This set into motion a cycle of violence towards his wife. He would repeatedly bash her, and on one occasion, he pressed his thumb so hard on her windpipe that she almost slipped into unconsciousness. This pattern would be repeated time and time again. He would drink, take drugs, become violent, and be admitted to the psychiatric hospital. During one visit, he told a psychiatrist that he wanted to kill his wife and his family. But following these revelations, he discharged himself and returned home. Despite their dysfunctional life together, on the 4th of February, 1973, Janice gave birth to a baby boy, Craig Archibald McCafferty. When she felt pregnant, I thought, wow, this is the greatest thing ever, and uh, it just changed my life. At first, the birth of little Craig seemed to be the inspiration McCafferty needed to get his life in order. He became a doting father and adored his son. But in a tragic event, the newfound joy the couple felt from the arrival of their son would come crashing down. In the early hours of Saturday the 17th of March, Craig's cries echoed through the McCafferty home. 
Janice checked on him, found him to be hungry, and carried him to bed with her to feed him. As Craig fed, Janice started to doze off and soon slipped into a deep sleep. Hours passed, and around 9am that same morning, Janice stirred from her slumber. As she drifted into consciousness, a wave of panic swept across her as she felt something between her and the mattress. With a sickening realisation, she jumped up and turned her gaze to the bed. Laying still and lifeless on the mattress where she had been was the body of little Craig. There was blood on his face and blood on her nightgown. Janice had fallen asleep mid-feed and smothered their six-week-old baby. Both Janice and McCafferty were devastated. An inquest into the death of Craig was held on the 24th of August, 1973. The coroner's findings were that Craig had died accidentally due to his mother falling asleep on top of him. Janice was cleared of any wrongdoing. The coroner stating, I must say, in the interests of the young mother, I cannot find anything to be critical of her for what happened. McCafferty, however, was not so forgiving. He had left Janice a week after the death of Craig and had been increasingly hostile towards her. Following the funeral for Craig, a group of family and friends gathered at the McCafferty home to grieve. Archie played a record of the song titled Nobody's Child in honour of the child he had just lost. This would be the first time the resentment he felt towards Janice would erupt. He unleashed a tirade of abuse and accusation and soon escalated to a physical altercation from which Janice was forced to flee. McCafferty gave chase and took to Janice with a fence picket. Janice's brother and a friend rushed to her aid and McCafferty was beaten by the pair. The next day, a battered and bloody McCafferty arrived sheepishly at the doorstep of his parents' home in Bass Hill. His parents, concerned for his mental and physical well-being, pleaded with him to seek help and readmit himself to a psychiatric hospital. McCafferty was taken to the Parramatta Psychiatric Centre for treatment. He remained there for three days before checking out. Upon leaving the hospital, McCafferty attended a tattoo parlour to have the phrase, In memory of Craig, inked on his chest inside an image of a cross-shaped tombstone. His mental state took a rapid decline, and the anger over losing his precious son would sporadically boil over to a violent rage. He plunged into a haze of alcohol and drugs, and although this masked the pain for a time, the anger he felt still simmered below the surface. I was having a lot of terrible thoughts, uh, uh, because I don't think my, my son should be dead. I so said it's, it's made me real angry towards people, and I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very unsafe. As a form of therapy, he attended the tattoo parlour on a number of occasions, tattooing over existing prison tattoos and filling any spaces he had left on his already heavily inked body, the most meaningful of which would be a simple number, the number seven. McCafferty had developed an obsession with this number, but this connection would soon take on a more sinister significance. McCafferty didn't have any contact with Janice following his attack on her the day of Craig's funeral. But on the 23rd of August, 1973, he would reach out. It was the night before the inquest into Craig's death, and Janice had settled in for a quiet evening when the sound of breaking glass broke through the silence. Two objects were sent crashing through the front window of her home, and on closer inspection, she discovered that they were bricks. Both bricks had notes wrapped around them. The first note read, You and the rest of your family can go and get fucked because anyone who has anything to do with me is going to die of a bad death. You know who this letter is from, so take warning because Bill is the next cab off the rank. Then you go one by one. Signed, You Know Who. Bill was a reference to Bill Rean who was Janice's mother's boyfriend. The second note continued, The only thing in my mind is to kill you, your mother, and Bill Reen. This is not a bluff, because I'm that dirty on all of you for the death of my son. But I can't let it go at that. I have a matter of a few guns, so I'm going to use them on you all for satisfaction. Beware. Janice knew McCafferty was capable of violence, but his threats now indicated... He was capable of much more than physical assault. In his youth, he had killed, 
but this time, it seemed his victims would not be animals. In the week leading up to the day of the coroner's inquest, McCafferty had assembled a ragtag gang of outcasts he had met in hospital and at the local tattooist. McCafferty, who was quite a few years their senior, took them under his wing and assumed the role of a father figure. The matriarch of the group was 26-year-old Carol Howes. McCafferty and Carol had met while they were both in the psychiatric hospital at Parramatta. Carol had taken a shining to McCafferty, who had talked her out of committing suicide. Upon leaving the hospital, the pair moved into an apartment together in the western suburb of Earlwood. Living in the flat with McCafferty and Carol was teenager Julie Todd. Julie had spent time in the hospital when McCafferty and Carol met, and with nowhere else to go, they took pity on her and invited her to live with them. Additional members of the gang included two 17-year-olds, Michael Meredith and Richard Whittington. The teens, known to friends as Mick and Dick, had met Archie in a tattoo parlour on one of his visits. The sixth member of the gang was a Richard Webster, who McCafferty met through his brother. The six had felt an instant bond with McCafferty, and all accounts suggest that he had developed a Manson-like influence over them. With this influence, he would soon orchestrate a violent rampage. The evening of the 24th of August, 1973, it was closing time at the Canterbury Hotel. As part of his daily routine, World War II veteran George Anson had spent the day outside the hotel selling newspapers, and when the evening came, he made his way inside the venue to drink. After the last drinks were called, George finished his beer and made his way out into the main street. Under the influence of a number of drinks, he stumbled his way along the road towards his home nearby. Around the same time, McCafferty and his crew had made their way to Canterbury from the nearby suburb of Earlwood. They had stolen a Volkswagen and were cruising the streets looking for someone to mug for money. Being an older gentleman who was also in an inebriated state, George Anson looked like the perfect mark. Upon spotting him, the gang eased the vehicle to a halt. They exited and swarmed on the man. Seizing Anson by the throat, McCaffrey dragged him to a side street. Anson was unable to fight them off, but he managed to utter the words, You young cunt. McCafferty, who was high on angel dust, instantly snapped. He threw Anson to the ground and kicked him furiously to the head and ribs. It was then that McCafferty first heard the two words in his mind. The two words repeated over and over. Kill seven. Kill seven. Kill seven. George was now brutally battered and kneeling in the gutter, gasping for air. Upon hearing the voice in his head, McCafferty produced a knife and he repeatedly forced it deep into the back and neck of George, stopping intentionally on the seventh blow. I just got out of the car and as the guy was coming down towards me, I grabbed him by the, the scruff of the neck. The next man he's laying on the floor stabbed to death. As the gang hurried back to the Volkswagen, George Anson lay on the road, blood spilling from his lifeless body. In a final act of cruelty, McCafferty kicked him in the head as he fled the scene. His injuries were so severe, they would claim his life. Back in the car, Rick Webster, shocked by what he had witnessed, questioned McCafferty. Why the fuck did you do that? McCafferty, seething about being questioned by Rick, responded. I stabbed him because he called me a young cunt. Now drive, you fucking idiot. The gang now sat in silence as they drove back to Earlwood. Before returning home, McCafferty and his followers stopped by a local drive-in fast food bar to order burgers. McCafferty slipped away to the restroom to clean up. While he washed in the sink, the face of his deceased son appeared in the mirror, staring back at him. McCafferty reached out to him, but he disappeared. And then, for the second time, he heard the phrase in his head, Kill seven. Kill seven. Kill seven. When the gang returned home, McCafferty confided in Julie. I couldn't help myself. I couldn't stop. I can't understand why I did it. A voice. It was Craig's voice. He told me to kill, kill, kill. The night of the 27th of August, 1973, 42-year-old miner Ronald Cox had just finished a late shift 
I was driving home to the suburb of Villawood in Sydney's west. The night was cold and wet, and so when he spotted two teenagers hitchhiking in the rain, he felt sorry for them. He stopped and offered them a ride. As he opened the door, he was greeted with the barrel of a gun aimed squarely at his head. The two teens forced their way into the car and ordered Ronald to drive. Meanwhile, McCarthy was with the other members of the gang, visiting Craig's gravesite. He had been there during the day and had claimed to have heard Craig's voice again. He now sat in the dark, high on angel dust and engulfed by the cold fog. Through the haze appeared a light above the grave. From this light emerged a figure. McCafferty could see a man who he believed to be an adult version of his son. For some reason I saw, it was like a light next to my son's grave and uh, someone appeared. It, it was like a, a 19 or a 20 year old version of I me. Mean, well, when he said, hi dad, or it's me dad, you know, and uh, we were talking and he said, listen, kill seven people and I'll come back to life. The lights of an arriving car spilled across the cemetery and illuminated the grave site. Three figures emerged from the vehicle, Julie, Mick, and another. It was Ronald Cox, and the pair marched him towards McCafferty at gunpoint. Under the instruction of McCafferty, the pair had posed as hitchhikers with the intention of luring another victim to the cemetery. Number two of seven. Seeing the silhouettes of the three in the headlights, McCafferty eagerly ran towards them. His conversation with his son had cemented his resolve to do what he felt he needed to do to bring Craig back. Ronald was forced to the ground and McCafferty and Mick held rifles to the back of his head. He was begging for his life and pleaded with the men not to kill him as he had seven children. When he said, don't kill me, I've got seven kids, the number seven triggered me. That's what triggered me, and I turned to Mick, I said, kill him. And that was it. And with that, he and Mick both shot around into the back of Ronald Cox's head, killing him instantly. As they left the cemetery, McCafferty could still see the light shining over his son's grave. And within that light, there was a figure. The figure laughed with joy. Seeing and hearing this prompted McCafferty to join in, and he burst into a fit of laughter as the light faded into the distance in the rearview mirror. Following the murder of Ronald Cox, the gang retreated to McCafferty's apartment, where they spent the night drinking and watching television. But McCafferty couldn't rest. Inside his head, the words, Kill Seven, looped over and over. In the early hours of the next day, McCafferty prompted Julie and Dick to pose as hitchhikers along Enmore Road not far from the suburb of Earlwood. Again, another driver taking pity on them stopped to offer them a ride. Again, a firearm was produced and the pair forced their way into the vehicle of the kind stranger. The driver, Evangelist Collius, a 24-year-old driving instructor, was pushed into the back of the car and forced to lie on the floor. The pair drove back to Earlwood, where McCafferty waited anxiously. Upon their arrival, McCafferty jumped in the driver's seat and drove towards the suburb of Blacktown. The suburb where his ex-wife Janice lived with her mother and stepfather. It seemed that now would be the time McCafferty would make good of the threats he had sent smashing through Janice's window on the notes wrapped around bricks. But before dealing with Janice and her family, Evangelist Collius would become McCafferty's third victim. As he lay prone in the back of the car, McCafferty instructed Dick to put the sawn off .22 to his head. Dick pressed it against his skull and pulled the trigger. Car stopped. Dick's turned around going bang, straight in the head, straight in the middle of his head. And as he shot him, all the blood's run over me. It was like the blood was burning me. And uh, I said, I want him out of the car. So we threw him out of the car and I got in the driver's seat and I ran over him to make sure he was dead twice. Fueled by a burning rage and set on revenge, McCafferty set his course for Blacktown where he planned to deal with the one he felt had taken his son from him. As he drove, the words, Kill Seven, surged through his mind. But, as luck would have it, the gang soon discovered 
they didn't have enough petrol in Collius's car to make it to Blacktown. And with that, they retreated to McCafferty's apartment, back in Earlwood. The murder of Janice and her family was put on hold, and McCafferty set his sights on a new victim. It would be Rick Webster, the young follower of McCafferty, who had the nerve to question him after the murder of George Anson. At the time of the murder, McCafferty had viewed his questioning of him as being disloyal, and with that, he had sealed his fate. Rick Webster was to be victim number four. Janice, her mother, and her stepfather would be five, six, and seven. McCafferty, along with Mick and Dick, followed Webster to the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper building, where he worked as a junior compositor. The three sat in a stolen van out the front of the building, waiting for Rick to emerge. But Rick had been tipped off by a fellow gang member and was on the lookout for McCafferty. He soon spotted the van and the three waiting inside and quickly alerted the police. He shared with them his knowledge of the murders and how McCafferty intended to kill him and three others. Squad cars swarmed on the Herald Sun building and the area was cordoned off. As heavily armed police forced open the doors of the van, they discovered McCafferty and his two followers, rifles drawn and loaded. So I was going to blow him away as he came down the stairs. Next minute there's a gun on my, my head. Don't move a muscle, the cop has said, or you're dead. And that was it, it's my arrest. While on the way to the station, McCafferty shared with police a matter-of-fact confession. All right, I knocked the bloke at Canterbury. I knocked the bloke at Leppington Cemetery. And I knocked the bloke at Maryland's. I knocked all three of them. McCafferty also shared with detectives his intention towards his ex-wife, Janice, on the night they killed Evangelist Collius. I was going to Blacktown to kill three people. I was going to go into the house and just start blasting away until they were all dead. They are very lucky people that the car didn't have enough petrol. He also added that he had intended to cut off his wife's head and send it in a box to the Chief of the Criminal Investigation Bureau. In February of 1974, McCafferty stood trial for the three murders. He pleaded not guilty on the grounds of insanity. Three psychiatrists called to testify were unable to agree whether he was insane or not, but they did agree on one thing, and that was Archie McCafferty was a danger to society and would most likely kill again if given the chance. The jury agreed and found him guilty on all counts. He was then sentenced to three terms of life in prison. McCafferty's co-accused, his loyal group of misguided misfits, received varying sentences for their roles in the crimes. Michael Meredith and Richard Whittington were both sentenced to 18 years in jail. Richard Webster, who had found himself the target of McCafferty, was convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to four years in jail. Julie Todd was sentenced to 10 years, but hanged herself in the bathroom of Silverwater Detention Centre. Carol Howes, who was now heavily pregnant with McCafferty's baby, was acquitted of all charges and swore she would wait for McCafferty until his release. Even behind bars, McCafferty's resolve to kill Seven remained strong. I wanted to get number seven. Every time I had an opportunity to attack something, oh yeah, I still believed Craig was going to come back to life. Everyone for me was a victim, a, a, a potential kill. I, I was kept in a special cage and no one was allowed to come within six foot of that cage. But uh, I lured this Francis Drake. I used to call him Green Teeth and Gums because he had green teeth and all his gums were rotten, you know. And uh, so could you bring me a cup of water? As soon as he came over, I had him around the throat. And honestly, I near had him dead. They had to resuscitate him then and there. So from that point on, they never let anyone get close to me. McCafferty soon gained the reputation as being one of Australia's most violent prisoners, and one final act in jail would confirm he was worthy of the title. In 1981, fellow inmate Edward James Lloyd was found stabbed to death in his cell. McCafferty was charged with his murder. In 1997, McCafferty was granted parole on the condition that he would be deported to his place of birth. Here he now walks among the people of Scotland most of whom are oblivious of his violent past. Archie McCafferty has served 23 years for mass murder. Families of his victims say it's not enough. How could I ever forgive you, you mongrel? The mass murders in 1973 
followed the accidental death of McCafferty by his son. He set out to kill seven people, saying this would bring his child back to life. I don't think I was going to stop killing, really, because if I had to kill those four and Craig hadn't have come back, my state of mind at that time, I probably would have thought, well, I'm doing something wrong here. Uh, and I would have kept going back to the grave to get whatever feedback I was getting. And I believe I would have kept on killing if I hadn't have been caught. So that number seven may have become 17, it may have become 77. Who knows? I don't know. But uh, I felt no remorse, no nothing. I, I, I don't think I'd done anything wrong back then, but something created it and caused it. And it, it, there's no answer for it. I, I don't know. I, I blame the death of my son. And that's the only way I can look at it because what happened is because of him. So, you know, and, and, and I was out of tune with reality as we know it, that's all. And whether I'm crazy or schizophrenic or whatever, they, all the tags they put on me, I still don't think that people know what happened back then. Before I wrap up, I'd like to give a quick shout out and thank you to the members and admin of the Facebook group, Podcasts We Listen To. Special mention and extra thanks goes out to Dawn Linlad, who was the first person to give Felon True Crime a plug on the page. If you're unfamiliar with the group and looking for new podcasts, check it out and add a podcast or 10 to your rotation. Speaking of new podcasts to add to your listening schedule, if you haven't done so already, I highly recommend a podcast dedicated to UK true crime called They Walk Among Us. Each episode is suspenseful, thoroughly researched, and really well written. It's quickly become one of my favorites. So check it out at theywalkamonguspodcast.com. And while on the topic of They Walk Among Us, we've actually been in contact with each other, and we've planned to do a special case swap episode that will be coming up soon, so stay tuned. If you're wanting to stay on top of felon updates and media, the Facebook page can be found at facebook.com forward slash felon true crime and Instagram and Twitter, at Fallon True Crime. Finally, if you've enjoyed the podcast so far, please do stop by iTunes or your favorite podcast medium to rate and review. Every rating and review helps. Thanks for listening.